what should the Black Lives Matter movement demand? Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Ruth Wilson Gilmore discusses reform and revolution, and Monica Jones, a young transgender activist, talks about her own fight against police abuses. All that and a few words from me on the missing millions in prison and jail who are not really missing. Welcome to our program. What do Coke Industries, owned by the conservative Koch brothers, the ACLU, and the liberal Ford Foundation have in common? Well, usually not much, but recently they came together in a broad coalition that they say is going to invest millions of dollars in confronting criminal justice reform. They're worried about overcrowding. They're worried about innocent people behind bars. And there's probably more to it, too. But none of that has our next guest reassured. Her name is Ruth Wilson Gilmore. She's a professor at the City University of New York Graduate Center. And she's the author of the book Golden Gulag, Prisons, Surplus, Crisis, and Opposition in Globalizing California. Ruth Wilson Gilmore is also a founding member of Critical Resistance, the anti-prison movement. Ruth, welcome. Glad to have you. It's good to be here. I am sure that you, like me, saw that announcement about the Coke Ford Center for American Progress, ACLU, coming together story, and your mind kind of boggled, or did it? What was your reaction? They might accomplish something useful. I can't say no. They've got so many resources. They might do something that will have a, a beneficial effect for certain kinds of people who have been incarcerated either for long periods of time or, as it were, in and out, um, and maybe for some of the communities where those people come from. However, what worries me the most is that the kind of rhetoric that has accompanied these, these kinds of bipartisan consensus is that we can see um, uh, in the experience that many of us had in California last fall with Proposition 47 is to harden the system for everybody who doesn't stand to benefit. So from give it. us an example of the rhetoric. Okay, the rhetoric was this law, Proposition 47, which would change the sentencing um, for certain kinds of uh, low level property uh, offenses. Well, so far, so good. This law is written so that certain kinds of people will never get out of prison. Yeah. Why bother? Why bother? Most people get out of prison. So saying that hardens in rhetoric and also in practice mm -hmm. um, a system that, although it declined on a national level between 2010 and 2012, shot back up again in 2013. Mm -hmm. You've pointed out many times that it's not just the right who've been in responsible for increasing penalties for certain crimes that lead to extended uh, periods of incarceration for folks. Has the sort of liberal edge of the spectrum learned anything? And I was shocked to see Maxine Waters, one of the most progressive people in Congress, had been part of this process that you describe in your book. Willie Brown, who was a very, very powerful person in California politics uh, for a long time, served as the Speaker of the California State Assembly for many years. And in the early 80s, um, he, a member of the Democratic Party, but embraced by both of the dominant parties, said, sooner or later, everyone is going to have to kneel before the altar of prisons. And this goes back to the question of legitimacy, yeah. state legitimacy, um, public sector legitimacy. And he was indeed right, and we still are living the long-term effects of his having been correct in, in the fact that prisons have become almost um, quasi-religious in so far as people imagine that they are necessary at the scale and scope to which they've developed over the last 30 years. And what gives you reason to believe, or maybe a glimpse, of another possibility or another set of possibilities? Do you have a vision of how we could do this differently? Oh, man, we just take the money and start again. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's a short answer, but how do we get there? Yeah. The long answer. Well, over the years, I've been working with all different kinds of people in many walks of life, both here in the States and abroad, uh, South Africa, Portugal, I mean, uh, wide variety of places. Uh, and one of the things that we've noticed is wherever capital wields a big stick, 
i.e. a big stick against worker organizing, mm -hmm. a big stick against good pay and benefits. Wherever capital wields a big stick, the all-purpose use of prisons is more prevalent. Mm -hmm. That also means wherever inequality is deep, the use of prisons is more prevalent. So the United States is first, Russia is second, the UK is third, and so forth. Um, and South Africa is up there as well. But so where I find hope is in thinking about and working with people who are indeed themselves organizing modestly educated people in the prime of life. I get hope from thinking about the fact that uh, certain people who are active in the AFL-CIO um, Central Council on a national scale are focusing now on mass incarceration and trying to get off the false scent of thinking the problem is private prisons and onto the true mm. scent, which is that resources that can go to salaries and well-being are going into prison. And this brings us back to what the Coke Industries guys are up to. If there's one thing Coke Industries has done, it's been to smash unions, smash unions, smash unions. And while um, they might, uh, as individuals, the Koch brothers and as uh, a bunch of shareholders, think that the, uh, the laws criminalizing so many people in the United States have gone too far. The fact is they are not at all interested in restoring the power of, let's say, American labor, right. which is absolutely necessary, both for people who are documented not to work, and that's the 65 million or more who have been through prison in the United States, as well as those who are not documented mm -hmm. to work, the immigrants who are, in, who are vulnerable to criminalization and deportation. So that's a lot of people. Mm -hmm. That's like 90 million people. So I get hope from thinking how many people might be, and indeed in some organizations are, focused on, on, on turning over or overturning this heinous system. And what do you consider a non-reformist reform? A non-reformist reform is any reform that does not extend the life or the scope of the prison industrial complex. So yeah, a non-reformist reform would be to decriminalize, let's say, drug possession. This is not my goal, but it's what many people are for. As long as that reform doesn't say, but certain other people should go to prison longer. Right? A non-reformist reform is one in which people understand that uh, something as individualized as compassionate release uh, for people who are in prison for part or all of their lives who face um, uh, uh, mortal illnesses, um, that, that compassionate release is not a replacement for complete recalibration of sentences in general. It's non-reformist reform is actually a pretty simple idea that, um, that every abolitionist uses as a test before entering into an alliance with people who aren't necessarily ready now or ever to say abolition is what our goal is. And when you say abolition, prison abolition, explain to folks what that looks like for you. What do you mean by that? Prison abolition is uh, a way of imagining a world in which interpersonal harm, uh, uh, economic need, um, social and um, um, uh, health vulnerability are things of the past. Uh, prison abolition is a way of imagining a world in which people don't solve problems by raising their hands at one another, that people do not imagine that the only way to get help and uh, have their welfare looked at, looked, looked after, is by uh, going to prison, uh, that people don't imagine that the kinds of um, uh, ordinary social disorders that we all experience, whether we live in big cities like New York or in quiet little rural communities, that we all experience are best dealt with through criminalization yeah. and punishment. So prison abolition is actually about imagining a world that is a different order. And when I say that, I don't mean pie in the sky, but rather look at what people do today to solve problems. So insight women of color against violence who have been working very hard to figure out alternate ways to deal with something that's extremely frightening, 
uh, which is domestic violence. Yeah. Or to look in the past and see how uh, the um, uh, black people in the South under Reconstruction built entire societies you know, from, it appears from nothing, but obviously they were building societies from what their dreams were of a society when slavery would no longer exist, but they understood that freedom wasn't merely the absence of enslavement, but it was the presence of certain kinds of social and political and economic relationships that emerged in that place as things like public education and universal um, voting, including children. So that gets to the question of how do we redirect all the energies that get produced, fear and trauma, in a media environment that gives us stories all the time that are really scary about crime, particularly in our neighborhoods? This is such a good question. Um, and this is, it's in answering this question that I imagine the uh, kind of anarchy of social media <laughs> can play a fantastically important role. And that is to say that people are especially, but not only young people, are experiencing a wide variety of accounts of things yeah. that through the mainstream media, whether it's broadcast or cable, is only ever um, organized through reminding you mm -hmm. of whom you should be frightened mm -hmm. all the time. So that's one thing. Another thing that comes to mind, and I think it's because I'm on camera, is that um, People, all different kinds of people, learn to use fear for something other than um, uh, uh, suppressing the self. Um, I have stage fright. I have a really bad stage fright. And an actor years ago taught me how to use that fear to come across as an energetic and engaged uh, interlocutor, <laughs> right? So we can use our fear. Um, to get to somewhere else. Now, somebody in the audience is probably thinking, yeah, but if somebody you know, comes at you with a fist or a weapon, what are you going to do? Well, sometimes fear is appropriate. I'm not a fool, and I don't think anybody listening to us today is foolish, but we have this sensibility. It's a, it's a, it's a feeling of what's possible in the world that we can actually alter. We can change how we feel. Cedric Robinson, who was one of my mentors, who wrote a brilliant book called Black Marxism, um, remarked recently that experience is important, but consciousness is what matters. It absolutely does. It absolutely does. And if we could be conscious of how we experience things and then direct our energy, and we have a lot of energy when you're frightened, um, towards something that would be more conducive to resolving the relations that produce fear, then perhaps we'll get where we need to go. I mean, remember that uh, Darren Wilson was exculpated not once but twice uh, for uh, the, the killing, the extra legal killing of Michael Brown by convincing people that he was frightened. And this is where I have a hard time with this particular bipartisan coalition um, that is gathered together under the brand of Coke Industries and so forth, and that is, that Newt Gingrich, who in the Contract on America back in 1994, was calling for everybody to support building as many prisons as it takes, um, now says, well, prison is for the people we're afraid of, not for the people we're just mad at. Well, afraid isn't good enough. There, are, there have to be other ways that we think about the problem of harm and what to do about it. And that we get away from thinking that all crime is about harm rather than how we have organized our entire social order. You describe in your book, Golden Gulag, a community of mothers who come together and actually redirect that energy through meetings and through working together and coming to understand each other and the system better uh, to make some real change in California. I'm going to encourage people to check it out in the book. Are there groups out there working in the U.S. today that, that inspire you in the same kind of way? I don't know whether Black Lives Matter is the one you would name. but Black Lives Matter has been so inspirational to me. I want to give a shout out to Patrice uh, Cullors and Alicia Garza and Opel Tometi and all of the people who putting their thought into, into uh, combination 
with those three amazing, strong, wonderful women have started chapters around North America and abroad called Black Lives Matter. I work with uh, young people of Cabo Verdean descent in Portugal, uh, young meaning in their teens through 30s, who have started a Black Lives Matter chapter there um, as well. Uh, and what they're doing in Portugal and what I think some of the chapters here in the States, in North America, I should say, are doing is to get past the immediate and heinous and heartbreaking incidents and try to think about what the underlying social order is that has produced the possibility that police can blow away black people with no um, consequence. Mm -hmm. And so one thing that I, I understand people active in Black Lives Matters understand is that the capacity to kill is actually a precondition for the capacity to incarcerate. And so we have to address both of those problems. And in order to do that, we have to think about the entire social order. What kind of economy do we want to live? in and how can we organize it in the richest country in the history of the world. You describe the massive expansion of incarceration, the building of prisons, coinciding with economic shifts. Right now we're looking at an environmental shift in this state that you've studied, California, um, with the declaration of this um, drought, worst in, in, in centuries. What do you think will come of this and, and will it have an effect on this situation that you've s discovered and covered in global in Golden Gulag? That's a great question. I'd like to think that the um, scarcity of water in California's Central Valley, which is where most of the new prisons in that state have been built, will provide more compelling uh, uh, pressure on the state of California to close prisons that many people, many kinds of advocates and advocate, activists have been trying to get the state to close for some time. However, there's a flip side to this um, that's really quite interesting and a little bit shocking, and that is um, periodically in California there have been uh, issues, crises concerning water, and although this year the situation is worse than ever. Um, 10 years ago and 20 years ago and 30 years ago, people thought that that year was the worst year ever. One of the arguments that California uh, made uh, in uh, support of building prisons and taking agricultural land out of production was to say, if we take the land out of production, we'll use less water. So a prison is a good thing because although it's a city, it uses less water than, say, land devoted to growing cotton. So we could see it go either way, we which makes this an important way. moment for activism and change. Ruth Wilson Gilmore, thank you so very much. Thank you for having me. Golden Gulag is the book. We'll have a link at our website. Check it out. Did you know you could be arrested for, quote, manifesting an intent to commit a crime? Monica Jones was arrested in Phoenix, Arizona after a protest, and her case became an international news story. We spoke to her in New York. Project Rose Just going through the whole justice system is violence. If, you, if you're a single mother and you're a sex worker and you get arrested, who's going to take care of your kids? If you decide to leave sex work for any other reason, then you have a charge on your, on your records forever. And so trying to get a job, trying to get to school, trying to get a, a degree, it's pretty hard. You hear the term walking while trans. That is just the basic um, thing of walking down the street and the interactions when you have people do with transphobia slurs, um, people misgenderfying you, interactions with the cop, police harassments, and violence that you face just walking down the street. And so just, and just imagine with these, um, these laws that criminalize sex work, the most vulnerable of those people are people, um, trans people and trans people of color. And so when you, when you look at the arrests, you see most people are trans, people of color. Hey, hey, ho, ho, ho. Project Rose has got to go. In 2013, Monica Jones helped organize a protest against Project Rose, a collaboration between the Arizona State University School of Social Work and Phoenix Police. The program combines prostitution arrests with the offer of social services. What they did was they used Backpage um, 
arrest um, street-based sex workers and to get them to go to this church, which is called Bethany Home Bible Church. And they took them there, handcuffed it, um, and to try to get them service. If they refused service, they were um, prosecuted. Sex work is a job. It should be respected as that. And so as a social worker, you need to address the issues surrounding like education, um, housing, health care, access to health care, HIV, and other laws around that instead of focusing on sex work. Hours after the protest, Monica was arrested and charged with, quote, manifesting the intent to commit prostitution. What is the manifestation charge? That's basically um, criminalizing everyday action by what area town you're in, what you're wearing, talking to passerbyers, um, hailing a taxi, having condoms on you, asking someone if they're a cop. What these laws do is basically criminalize everyday action. And so it's, it's, this portion um, targets um, women of color and trans women of color. If you're a police officer and you're transphobic and you have a bias, you can just use that. I was arrested and convicted and tried um, for this manifestation. What happened later is that I went to trial the tr and the ACLU joined in. They filed a motion to dismiss all challenge the constitutionality of the law. Eight days later, the prosecutors decided not to file any more charges against me. After her arrest in Arizona became a national news story, Monica lobbied at the United Nations in Geneva for an investigation of human rights abuses committed by the U.S. against sex workers and transgender women of color. I'm here to talk about sex worker rights and a the stigma and criminalization of sex workers. We went and talked to a couple of countries to get them to um, ask the U.S. to um, honor recommendation 86. I also address issues over, about trans issues and um, prison and um, the violence that um, sex worker rights activists face. Uh, what's next for me? Trying to finish school because right now my school had to get take have taken a hit because of my case and my activism. And so trying to finish that, um, get my degree, um, continue my advocacy work uh, for trans rights and sex worker rights. That was activist Monica Jones, filmed right here in New York City. It's becoming popular in the media to talk about the missing millions, the 1.5 million African-American men in their prime who are missing from civic life. Those millions, it's explained, are mostly missing because they've died young or been locked up. There's been a catastrophic rise of incarceration in the U.S. over the past four decades. But missing from the missing men stories are those women whose rates of incarceration have risen fastest of all. In 2013, approximately 111,000 women were in U.S. prisons, a 900 percent increase over 1977. They are absent from our streets and also from this coverage. As every study shows, the majority of incarcerated women are nonviolent offenders with little education or employment experience and lots of history of abuse. Girls of color are more likely to be locked up than white girls. Gender nonconforming girls are most likely of all. And two-thirds of incarcerated women have kids. They're not missing. They're missed. Incarceration tears families and communities apart. To let some women know they hadn't been forgotten, three young activists recently organized a performance in a women's prison called Taconic about an hour outside of New York. As prison policies tend to have men, not women, in mind, they brought a play by, with, and about women, Eve Ensler's Vagina Monologues. And to perform, they brought professional actresses, activists, and three women who had served a decade or more of time right here and in the maximum security prison across the street. Coming back and watching their audience stream in, the cast fell quieter as women saw women they'd left behind inside and guards saw women they'd not seen since they got out. Visitors and prisoners aren't allowed to hug or get close or touch in prison. Separation is sternly enforced. Still, after 90 minutes of laughing, crying, whooping, and tearing up together, thanks to the tragic comic monologues, all the women were feeling a lot. Before they left, they semicircled into a group air hug. Old arms, young arms, arms in silk, 
arms in made for men green cotton prison tops, reaching out towards one another. The missing aren't missing. They're kept at a distance. We can break that distance. What if we did? Those inside aren't missing. They're waiting on us for justice. What's missing isn't them, it's us. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, first law professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw. The exclusion of women and girls actually undermines the ability to see the structural dimension yeah. of the problem. Then we turn to the crisis facing elders. I'm angry because being a home health aide, you're not getting enough money. I think we should get paid at least $15 an hour, the cost of living. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, Patrice Cullors of Black Lives Matter. By the time I was 13, I had seen my entire community decimated by law enforcement. Ayi Lumumba Barrow. Every day I engage in anti-art, a violent system that is directed at uh, suppressing my imagination to perpetuate the imagination of the colonizer. <laughs> 